Just a quick reminder that in the last video, we learned about the coefficient of determination r squared and how it can help us measure the strength of regression relationships, in particular for our course, linear relationships. And then we saw the, all these different examples of scatter plots. And now we want to be able to calculate the coefficient of determination ourselves with a calculator. So I'm going to grab my calculator. I'm going to go to stat edit. So I had to move that over there for a second. So I'm going to, um, and I don't need to, but I'm going to clear out my data right here. Just clear the whole screen. There it goes. Now stat number one, edit. I'm going to go up and press clear enter because I don't want that data that was in there. And I'm going to type. All right, I'm going to pause and I'll be right back. But all I'm going to be doing is typing while I'm away. There we have it. All the data are in there. Now I'm going to hit stat calculate and I'm going to hit number four linear regression. Actually, it just occurred to me as I'm doing this that I don't remember if I have my diagnostic on. Yep, I do. So I'm good. So let me quit and get out of there. Sorry, stat, calculate one more time. Number four linear regression. L1 is where my X list is. L2 is my Y list. I'm not going to bother storing the regression equation in the frequency list in this class. We always leave blank and I'll go to calculate. And there's my R squared, 0.473. So let me type that in right here. Oops, I had 473. There you go, 473 when you round it. So there we have it. That's how to calculate the coefficient of determination your own self. All right, now let's look at whether, what to do when the coefficient of determination is found for us. So we have our example again of the percentage of the students in that state participating in the SATs and the median math score for the SATs for that state. And remember, if you're watching this in fall 2015, there's a little bit of a typo. There should be a decimal point right here. So it should be 1.23 instead of 123. Now the approximate sample size. Let's see here. Well, this isn't possibly the whole of all the states, so we would have to count. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So you'd be counting all the different dots. Well, what do you know? It actually works out to be 50. So this is 50. And of course, that's probably because this particular year is a sample of um, many years that the SAT has been given for these states. So 50 is our sample size. So that would be N, lowercase n. I love it when the computer program thinks it's smarter than me and wants to capitalize things. All right, so then how would you find this um, from your computer outputs and graphs? And the answer is, well, it's not really in this particular computer output. There's nothing over here that tells us what our sample size is. So we would have to do what I just did. We um, have to count the dots on the scatter plot to the best of our ability. And it can be a little strange because it can be hard to figure out exactly how many dots are in some of these clusters over here. So I guess I should say that N is approximately 50. Because of course, we're kind of guessing on some of these clumped up ones. But it makes a certain amount of sense. It would be all states. And then this is just a sample of min multiple years where this kind of effect occurs. All right, so may be a bit off. Um, the, if the computer output doesn't give it to us, which this particular computer output does not. All right, what type of variable is the median math score? Hmm. Well, technically, because it's a median, that means it actually is limited in the number of decimal places it can have. Um, it can't go on forever and ever and ever and ever like um, other some other values might be able to. So that actually makes it quantitative discrete because medians are limited um, to one or two more decimal places than the data itself actually has. So one would argue that it's quantitative discrete. Actually, I think I'm going to change that problem for future just because that's a little bit of an obscure um, thing to know that that has limited decimal places. So I'm just going to leave it as quantitative or qualitative. I'll get rid of the discrete continuous on that particular example. So let's just say it's quantitative and leave it at that. So sorry about that. I like those 
discrete continuous wants to be a little bit more obvious. So I'm just going to change it for future. So it just asks that it's quantitative. Now, level of measurement, however, we definitely can do. And that would be ratio, right? Because the lowest you could ever have is zero for any one of these. You can't have a negative um, math score, right? Negative is what it would take to be interval. And of course, since it's quantitative, it's likely not ordinal and it's definitely not nominal. All right, now the coefficient of determination, that is the R squared is 79.3% that you see right there. So that's the coefficient of determination that's given to you in the output. Just ignore the R squared adjusted. Um, the adjusted one it means that they've um, adjusted the data set to get rid of outliers and some other stuff. So we're not going to ever use that one. We're only going to ever use the regular R squared. That's the one we're interested in. Okay. So for us, it would be 0.793 or 79.3%. And there, that's typed up. So that's the R squared. Now we need to compute the correlation coefficient. Hmm. Okay. So the correlation coefficient is the square root of the coefficient of determination. I mean, if you remember, it's R, right? That's the correlation coefficient. And the computers in the, in the book are a little bit unclear about whether it's capital R or lowercase r. For our purposes, it doesn't matter. It's all the same for us. Okay, so what we want is we want r. Well, r is either the positive or the negative square root of r squared. Right? That will get you r. Forget about the 79 for three for a second. So r is plus or minus the square root of r squared. And whether it's plus or minus depends on the slope of the, of the regression line. Since this one is negative, it would be a negative r. If it was positive, it would be a positive r. So it's whatever is appropriate for the situation. Okay. So let me make that point. Um, plus or minus um, to match the slope. How about that? Okay, so you're going to make it positive if your slope is positive, make it negative if your slope is negative. In this case, our slope is negative. So we'll go with the negative one. So for our example, r is approximately the square root of 79.3%. But of course, nobody takes that. Oh, it's negative at that. Right? We want the negative one. So we want negative the square root of 0.793. There we go. So I need a calculator because I do not know the square root of 0.793 off the top of my head. So second square root, 0 0.793, enter, and I get 891. And there we have it. Now everything's got squiggly equals because all of this is rounded. So um, because it's all rounded, I'm just leaving it like that. So that is R. R is approximately 0.891, right? And you have to match the slope for your sign, sorry. So you have to match your slope positive or negative to match your sign. All right, we have calculated the co correlation coefficient. Now we need to interpret the R squared in the context of the situation. Well, that gets back to the whole um, percentage of the variability can be explained by blah, blah, blah. So that's the formal interpretation of R squared. So R squared measures the proportion of total variation in Y that is explained by the least squares regression line. So that's what we're going to use for our interpretation down here. So let me type that up one second. Okay, so R squared was 79.6 for us. So what we'll say is 79.3% percent means the proportion. So when, of the total variation in, and now we have to talk about Y. Y was our response variable, which is the median math SAT score can, um, is explained by the least squares regression line. There you have it. So the variability that we're seeing in these math scores, 79.3% of it can be explained by this regression line. 
which by the same token means about 20% of it, we're not sure why it's happening. We can't accommodate for it with our model. All right, we are all done with that example. So we have seen, um, first of all, a little review of quantitative and qualitative and how to count the dots. But then we also saw how to read for the coefficient of determination right there, and then how to use that very trickily. Trickily, it's a word. <laughs> it's very tricky um, to find your correlation coefficient. And remember, you have to pick the sign. I just can't stress this enough. Choose plus or minus to match the slope of the line. Right? So you have to choose your own plus or minus depending on the situation. And then our example has it as... Um, the negative slope because we had a negative slope to our line, so it's a negative correlation coefficient. And then this is how to structure your sentence to formally interpret the R squared value. All right, we're all done. Well, at least with this video. I'll see you back here for the next problem in another video. Actually, I take it back. I think I can get you the next one right here. So let's look at this one. This is the same problem that we've looked at a couple times. This is the fertility rate and the life expectancy for 192 countries in 1962. Now, um, the coefficient of determination is given to us, look, by Excel. It's right there. It's 0. 0.5803. So that's what I'm going to say. R squared is approximately, of course, it's always approximate because these are rounded by the computer, 0. 0.5803. And we're done. Compute the correlation coefficient from the given information. All right, there's another one. So we're going to have to find the square root of 0.5803. All right, so let me grab the calculator. I want the square root 0 0.5803. That gets me 0 0.762, roughly. All right, so let me type that up. All right, R is plus or minus the square root of R squared which means it's either positive or negative 0.5803, square root of 0.5803, which means it's plus or minus 0.762. So for us, in our example, our example has it so that R is point, negative 0.762. We choose the negative R value because the slope of our regression line is negative. You can see it's negative because it's that 5.0303 that we already interpreted in section 4.2. All right, now let's get another practice in of interpretation. So 58%, 58.03% to be precise, of the variability that we see in life expectancy. So why are some points higher than others, right? Why does that happen? Why do some countries have more life expectancy than, than what we would expect and less life expectancy than what we would expect? That variability, 58% of it, can be explained by the least squares regression line. By the same token, that means like what around 42% can't be explained by the regression line. We're not sure why it's happening. Now, a politician from another country sees our data and results for life expectancy and fertility rates. She determines that to get a longer life expectancy in her country, she should just restrict the number of children to one child per woman. What's wrong with that reasoning? Well, she's acting like if she just restricts it, then automatically life expectancy will go up. In other words, she's assuming a correlation equals causation, assuming a causal relationship. And that's not true. What's happening here in 1962 is countries over on the left side have better health care. They're wealthier countries. They have more infrastructure. So they have a lower fertility rate and they have a higher life expectancy. Countries over here on the far right have a higher fertility rate, but they have a lower life expectancy because these are poor countries, countries where they don't have as much medicine or infrastructure. In other words, it's the infamous correlation is not causation. Let me type it up one second. There we have it. So this politician is inferring a causal relationship between fertility and life expectancy. That is, she thinks that just lowering the fertility rate will automatically mean that life expectancy goes up. That's not the case. This correlation that she's seeing between fertility and life expectancy is not a causation relationship because there are a lot of lurking variables, other things that are going on, like education, healthcare, infrastructure, etc. 
And that those items, these guys right here, would affect that relationship. They would affect both of those variables. Having a country with a strong healthcare system will have a higher life expectancy and a lower fertility rate naturally. All right, now we are all done with this video, and I'll see you back here um, for the next one.